Hello, today I'm going to talk to you about one of my favourite groups of women in the history of the City of London, the Billingsgate Fishwives. From the 1300s, fish was unloaded at Billingsgate, and there it would be processed by an army of women, the fish women or fishwives. It was dirty physical work, and it was actually women's work all across the country. But over the centuries, the Billingsgate fishwife came to occupy a very particular position in British cultural history. She didn't just clean and process the fish, however. The Billingsgate fishwife bought her own fish, put it into a basket, popped it on her head and headed out into the mean streets of the City of London. I say mean streets because she never knew what she was going to encounter. It might be starving beggars, perhaps a group of drunken apprentices on their way home after a night on the tiles, or she was very unlucky, a criminal intent on theft. So she had to be very streetwise indeed to hang on to both her mackerel and her money. Well, the fishwives thrived. They had a good business model. They could buy the fish very cheaply. Sometimes they'd buy all of a particular type of fish and they could undercut other traders because they were on foot. By the Tudor period, of course, the city had grown massively and there were more mouths to feed, meaning that fish trade became ever more important. In 1699, Billingsgate itself was made the official fish market for the city of London. The worshipful company of fishmongers was given certain rights to look at the quality of fish and even set some of the prices. But the independent-minded fishwives of Billingsgate were having no truck with this. They just continued as they always had. And it wasn't just their way of selling fish, it was their behaviour. They drank, they smoked, they spent their own money on whatever they wanted to spend it on. They were not averse to topping up their funds with a little bit of light prostitution and perhaps there was a little bit of involvement in river piracy too. It was perhaps inevitable that they were going to come into conflict with the authorities. In 1678 indeed a group of them appear at court. We don't know what crime it's for, it's probably some form of civil disorder or drunkenness or perhaps some sharp dealing but we do know what the judge thought of them because he wrote that these were women who drank who smoked and were impudent. Well, by the Georgian era, the city of London is also a city of satirists, writers, novelists and journalists, and they couldn't fail but notice this rather loud, colourful group of women on their doorstep. In 1703, a journalist from the London Spy magazine writes of his experience when he accidentally enters the wrong door in Billingsgate. He finds himself in a boozy drinking ken, a cellar in Billingsgate full of Billingsgate fishwives. They're smoking and they're quite inebriated because they've been drinking nipperkins. A nipperkin is a small glass, an eighth of a pint, and on this occasion they've been filled up with hot brandy and beer. The journalist noticed that there were several empty nipperkins ranged around every fishwife. He's treated to a series of catcalls and cheeky comments and he beats a hasty retreat. It's not long because before the Billingsgate fishwife becomes a nationally recognised stereotype. She becomes a symbol of all that's wrong with a modern Georgian woman of a certain class. She's vulgar, she doesn't know her place, she gets into fights, she has loose morals. However, she also has qualities which in a Georgian male might be seen as virtues. She's proud, courageous has no time for pretensions, and she's patriotic. She becomes a kind of female version of John Ball. We see her defending Britain against unwelcome foreigners, particularly the Frenchman, whom you can always recognise because his bottom is hanging out the back of his trousers. She's usually attacking him with a bottle or a lobster. Even more interestingly, sometimes we see the Billingsgate fishwife employed to remonstrate with the great and the good. She tells prime ministers and ministers off for being cowardly and not doing the right thing. Well, over the centuries, the fishwives managed to survive plagues, civil wars and fires. 
but it appears that the one thing they couldn't survive were the Victorians. When Billingsgate was rebuilt in 1877 by George Dance the Younger, it was state of the art. It had a modern cold store. It still required people to gut and clean the fish, but these women were not to be the vulgar, independent fishwives. In fact, the only woman at Billingsgate is a figure of Britannia who sits on top. The fishwife them herself, well, the coastal fishwives, became the subject of romantic portraits, and they were no longer hard-working women. There always seems to be a small child hanging onto their petticoats, and the coastal fishwife looks out the window, longing for the return of her man. But the Billingsgate fishwife doesn't even merit this. There's no sign of her in the city today, despite the fact she was literally there for centuries. All that we do have left of the Billingsgate fishwife are those cartoons, her appearances in literature and her common usage as an insult. To be a Billingsgate fishwife to this day is to be a shrewish, vulgar woman with bad language. But if there was ever an insult that needs to be reclaimed, I think it's the word fishwife because these women made a major contribution over the centuries to the lifeblood of the city and keeping it fed. And it seems to me that many of their so-called vices were indeed virtues. Thank you for listening. Goodbye. <laughs>